working on this book um, for me is perhaps the greatest privilege of my academic career and immersing myself in this history, uh, in interviewing the elders uh, with Elder Tippo uh, and also with my wife, Fiona, who accompanied me on one of these trips. Um, I think it's perhaps some of the best and most memorable writing and listening experiences I've had. It is not the sort of happy book and triumphalist account of mission. Uh, there are stories of truth and hardship and sorrow and difficulty, as well as very proud moments. Calls for Adventist work with Australian Aboriginal people began in the 1890s, roughly at the time Ellen White was in Kurumbong, establishing Avondale College. These times were full of racist language, and I apologise if anything expressed here um, is offensive. It would be offensive by current standards of the day, but as historians, we must use the words that were um, used in the past. It was not until 1908 that Adventist coal porter Henry Cooper began Bible studies at Baramba Mission, later the infamous Sherberg Settlement. And in the image on screen, you can see him uh, with his wife, Isabella, and a group of women who were their primary Bible study participants in those early years. They became concerned because as they spent quality time with the women and began to unpack scripture and the Bible, the women would be invariably sent out on work contracts for up to six months at a time. And so it was very challenging for them to maintain good relationships. And they soon decided that the only way forward was to establish their own independent mission, which was organized in consultation with Pastor Fulton and the Queensland government in far North Queensland, where they were allocated a 4,000 acre leasehold property, which was the property of the government, but for the use of the church and set aside for the purpose of an Aboriginal reserve. Rudge was not allowed to teach at Baramba about the Sabbath or any Adventist doctrines. In fact, the superintendent was quite negative about particular Christian groups proselytizing on his reserve. And so with some regret and a degree of frustration and joy, they set out for the far north. Just a quick geography lesson. So when we talk about uh, Sherberg or Baramba, that's very close to Mergen. And as you can see, that's just a little bit north west of Brisbane, I'm guessing some of you have uh, been there. And as you go further north past Rockhampton and Palm Island and Townsville, you'll arrive at Cairns, where we have the now famous Yarraba Mission on the coast and inland in the tablelands in the rainforest, we had the property that became known as Mona Mona, named after the parish of Mona Mona in government records at that time. The picture you see here is from about 1920, and it shows a camp of rainforest Aboriginal people commonly referred to as, um, yeah, I guess rainforest people, but the Bama, uh, B-A-M-A. And you can see that the limit, the living conditions they experienced were quite challenging. So they were eking out an existence on the edge of the rainforest, hiring themselves out as cheap labor for local property owners living very vulnerably in what terms we would, we would currently call it absolute poverty if this was an ADRA picture uh, in the 21st century and uh, very few opportunities for their children to receive any formal education whatsoever with very high mortality rates and very high death rates uh, as well. They were a primary source of extremely cheap labor for the settlers in the area who did not want them to be on a mission because they would then lose their labor supply for their own farms and agricultural activities. I just wanted to set the context a little bit, not in great length, but by the time our missionaries arrived in 1913, the end of an era had come and gone. The brutal period of frontier massacres was largely over, certainly in this part of Queensland, although there were still some massacres to come in the far west. Many Aboriginal people had been completely dispossessed of their lands under Cook's original claim of terra nullius, and they survived as best they could, exploited, often raped, abused, abducted, and enslaved, sometimes enslaved labor-like conditions. Drug addiction rates were very high, 
and they confronted daily relentless racism of the worst kind. Philip and Isabella Rudge arrived with Dora Cook, who was a Aboriginal woman from Barramba, uh, who had originally been at the nearby Yarraba mission and was an educated woman who spoke English. They were very enthusiastic about her presence. Nevertheless, conditions were very difficult. It was hot, it was dry, it was the build up to the, the wet season, the, the monsoon, and they had very little labor and supplies, but they began immediately to carve out a basic clearing beside the riverbanks. This is the, the flaggy creek uh, in a low flood prone area. And they did their best to construct their early dwellings out of slab timber that was hewn by hand. And as you can see, the roofs are made of the same materials as well. These were tough and difficult times for both missionary staff and the residents. I guess as I looked at that picture, a few things stood out for me, the kids on the veranda, I wonder what the building was in the house, the shingles on the roof, uh, the, the woman and the girl on the left-hand side, uh, that was Miriam Roy and uh, Pearl Branford, James Branford's daughter with Miriam's uh, little baby, and found out subsequently that um, the missionaries lived in the house upstairs and the children, they're the girls, their dormitory was downstairs and the missionaries would lie in bed at night time and listen to the girls talking to each other. And there's a few anecdotes of what they heard um, in the book. But just backtracking ever so slightly, while these conditions may seem difficult, keep in mind that only 30 years earlier, George Carrington had said, therefore says the white man, away with them, disperse them, shoot and poison them. We will utterly destroy them, their wives, their little ones, and we will go in and we will possess their land. Population of Aboriginal people in Queensland had declined by various estimates considerably, one of which is from 1 million down to about 100 to 200,000 survivors. Judge Charles Hayden wrote in the late 1870s, private persons go out to kill blacks and they call it snipe shooting. Shooting a snipe sounds better than murdering a man, but the blacks are never called men and women and children, rather miles, niggers, gins and piccaninnies. And he said it helped when you didn't call them men and women because it made the murdering a whole lot easier. One white settler who dispersed a group of natives, Nikans, in 1884, wrote the following words. They were easy running shots, close up. The native police rushed in with their scrub knives and killed off the children. I didn't mind the killing of the big bucks, but I didn't like the braining of the kids. In historical context, Queensland was an excite of extraordinary massacres and displacements. And we must always position that in the back of our minds as we consider what took place with the missionaries and with their motives. Certainly, Branford, Rudge and other superintendents who followed came to love the children and the residents of the mission, despite the obvious conditions of the day and, the, and the, the situation that they worked in. The chief protector argued in 1913, roughly when that picture was taken just a few years later, it is only by complete segregation and separation that the two races, that we can save them from hopeless contamination and eventual extinction, as well as safeguard the purity of our own white blood. That's the nature of the times. Roth, to his credit, was outraged that Queensland Aboriginal boys and girls could be purchased for as little as a bag of flour and one pound of tobacco, after which they effectively became child labourers or even sex slaves. Writing as late as 1912, one Adventist author described Aboriginal people as hideously ugly and wrote that they were rarely able to be made Christian. He concluded that one of the saddest sights in a black camp is the presence of a half caste child, nearly white, with the black man's temperament and undoubtedly the best way to Christianize them was to Christianize their children. And so there was an underlying racial agenda. Life was hard. 
The early mission was constructed by sheer grit and hard work. It was very difficult to convince local Aboriginal people to voluntarily relocate to the mission and uh, the local white people did not enjoy the loss of that cheap labour. And so there were enemies in the district as well. Throughout its life, the mission was self-sustaining largely only because of timber production. And you can see Reuben Totenhofer and George Mitchell at left with an enormous cowrie log. There is a similar one at one of the lakes. I think it might be Lake Eacham or, or similar in the far north. And that tree is estimated at between 600 and 1,000 years old. So they were certainly harvesting some magnificent timber uh, on that property. In the early years by Bullock and Cart and with the essential free labour of the Aboriginal residents who were rarely paid except for in rations. This picture shows the early residents. Ironically, it was Mariba people who were forcibly relocated first to the mission. They were in their area. A message was sent. They were encouraged to come to town to attend a show and get some free medical treatment. They were immediately surrounded by police and they were taken by force to the mission. They hopped off the train at Oak Forest and they walked the rest of the journey to the station. The superintendent wrote that it was a very difficult time because the Aboriginal people felt that they were under a new form of tyranny and the missionaries themselves were to be their new masters. In 1916, the group expanded considerably with the arrival of the Karanda mob. There had been protests by local white settlers who didn't want to lose their labour, but the chief protector eventually weighed in, uh, assumed that most of them were ill and drug addicted and they too were yeah, full-time residents of the mission from 1916 onwards.